Some of you are honest. That's great. I, I was at a funeral. My grandpa passed away last Sunday after church. Um, and that doesn't mean I had a bad week. My grandpa was so eager to see Jesus. It was unbelievable. And, uh, and he was in a lot of pain. And so he got to go see Jesus this week. And so we celebrate that. Uh, at first I was wondering, I felt bad. I wasn't doing a ton of crying. And I realized that when you have that perspective that he finally gets to be with his heavenly father, it really, really changes things, doesn't it? Uh, and so I was at the viewing on Thursday and the funeral on the funeral on uh, a Friday, and it was a great, great time uh, just to celebrate. And it was so interesting because it came up over and over and over again how Grandpa loved God and really was excited to go see him. And so uh, in those cases, sometimes you can even celebrate in the midst of in the midst of the sorrow, if you would. So, so that was great. And then, and then I have to share. You know, last night, last night I'm, I'm tired. If I look tired, it's because I am tired. Last night I had the joy at about 1.30 of, I got a phone call at about 1.30 and, and my phone's always on because I'm a pastor and people sometimes need something and it was, it was very interesting. Somebody from Alberta had given me a call. I'd met them at a different funeral at a different time and, uh, and they, were, they, they, they were going through a hard time and they called me every now and again and they had a buddy who was going through a hard time. So at 1.30 in the morning, I'm trying to explain to, to some guy about what it's like to have the love and the joy and the peace that only God can give. You know, I talk about that every week. And, uh, and so I had, I, had the, I had the opportunity to share that with somebody at 1.30 this morning about the love and the joy and the peace that only God can give. And I'll, I'll tell you what I knew right away is when I started talking to him, he wasn't quite ready for the love and the joy and the peace. He mostly wanted to complain about the pain and the suffering and the anger. And I tried to say there's love and joy and peace, but uh, sometimes we go to God and we go with prayer wanting answers. We just don't want to give him everything he tells us to give him to get the results. Um, and isn't, isn't it like that so often in life? We want something from God. We want it from God. We want it from God. We're like, hey, God, fix my problem. And he's like, I got a solution. All you have to do is this. And you're like, okay. In a different way, fix my problem. He's like, okay, plan B, do this. Okay, excuse me. What I really meant was, I want, I want you to give me something and I don't want to do anything in return. And so, um, I know that yesterday a seed was planted, and I am so excited because I believe one day, just like I was reminded at my grandpa's funeral, that grandpa plants seeds, and uh, one day somebody else is going to get the joy of going to their church and sharing about how they led somebody to Christ, I will know that, and, and those are seeds that are planted in those moments at 1.30 in the morning where you should wake up in the morning and you open your, open your eyes with toothpicks and you hold them open for a while and go, okay, I'm awake now, so, uh, but it was great. I had, I had a, a great week. I had a long week. And uh, next Sunday, I get to speak at Rosa River Bible Camp for the week. So uh, it'll be a busy week for me, planning, planning my stuff for here, but also speaking at eight sessions. So I am excited. So that's next Sunday. So you guys can pray for me all week because i got a lot of work to do before then. But uh, So as I'm tired, as I often don't have words, and as I actually had difficulty planning this week's message, last week was fun, wasn't it? making JJ get his toes caught in mouse traps. It was a ton of fun. Uh, and so this week when the topic changed a little bit, I was a little bit discouraged. It was, it was a bit tough for me to plan this one. So uh, let's go to a word of prayer. God, we love you. We love you in the awesome times, God, when everything is going great and sometimes we even almost forget about you when we shouldn't. But we also love you in the difficult times. We love that you've prepared a place for us that we can live with you forever. We love that you give us a glimpse every day of your love and your joy and your peace, God. I just pray that today as I am tired, as it was difficult this week, and with all my meetings and getting stuff done, I just thank you for what you're doing. And I believe that, God, there is somebody here this morning who just needs to be encouraged. And so I just pray that this new topic is, is encouraging to somebody and challenging to somebody else. We love you, God. In your precious name, amen. Amen. I was excited when I, I first started to prepare this message. Uh, as everybody knows... We've been going through a series called the Letters in Red series, looking at the words of Jesus. Uh, and actually, in the next two weeks, we're going to take a bit of a break, and we're going to talk about how to lead our friends to Jesus. We're not going to do that today. That's coming up over the next couple weeks. Tools in how to lead your friends to Jesus, because summer's not over, and there's still a lot of lake time where you get to go to the lake with your friends and lead them to Jesus. And so I didn't want to wait till, till fall when you're all playing sports and you're no longer hanging out with your friends 
And so I said, the next two weeks we're going to talk about uh, leading our friends to Jesus. But this week, we're talking about something that's fun, isn't it? Judging. Judging. And so it's one of my favorite things. Everybody loves the verses on judging, right? Like, because nobody likes to, maybe you do, anybody like to be judged? Anybody? I don't like to be judged. And so, and, and I don't even like to be criticized, not even judged. I don't like to be criticized. And so, you know what we do every time somebody criticizes you, we're like, boy, you've got to, we, we, we always remember that verse that says, don't, don't, don't look at the speck in your brother's eye when you've got a plank or a two by four in your own eye. And so anytime somebody corrects me, I'm like, buddy, yeah, yeah, maybe I did that, but you forget that I know you. And I know that you've got like a two by four. You've got a log cabin in your, in your eye. Um, and so, and, you know, I, and anytime somebody criticizes me, that's my go-to, right? Like, yeah, I might got problems, but you, you got bigger problems. And you want to start pointing out problems. You want to do this with me right now? I can do this. Let's start throwing problems at each other because I grew up in Gruntel. I know the stupid things that you have done. And so we can throw, we can throw stones all day long. And so we're going to read that verse again, just in case maybe we've misunderstood it. Okay, so Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. A lot of judging in there. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And then there's this weird part in this verse where I, I don't know what Jesus was talking about, and we have to look at it a bit later. It says, all of a sudden he goes, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So that... It's in there. It's, it doesn't make a lot of sense because I'm like, don't judge me, don't judge me, don't judge me. Oh, yeah, and don't throw, don't give pearls to pigs. I'm like, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But we're going to get to that yet. Don't worry. Um, but part of that is, is there because it, it, it helps us to understand that maybe this verse isn't what you thought it was. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning because you know me, I like to try and take things in context. But before we go further, let's just clarify a couple key words And basically the biggest word that we're going to clarify this morning is judging. Judging. Because we live in a world that no words mean what they used to mean. Very little stuff means today what it used to mean. Uh, And so we're going to talk about judging and what it is and what it is not, just to give some perspective. Now first of all, I like to think that judging is legalism to the extreme. It's pretty hard to argue that judging has nothing to do with legalism. Because judging, legalism, they're basically together, aren't they? You, I mean, if you go into the legal system, you're going to encounter a judge. So legalism and judging kind of go hand to hand. And judging and legalism in Christianity is just a great opportunity to focus on what other people are doing wrong. If focusing on salvation through works. It is then assuming you have the power to condemn or decide what works deserve hell. You see, it's easy to look at somebody else's mistakes. And what you do when you look at somebody else's mistakes is you immediately make their mistakes worse than your mistakes. Right? Because, look, I got problems, but they're not as big as your problems. And therefore, my problems aren't so bad, are they? And that's one of the things that, 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 we, that we risk doing. Number two, judging is looking at the failings of others and ignoring your own failings, which is kind of what we just said. It's, I'm bad, I'm just not as bad as you. And what we do is we actually hope that God grades on a curve. I don't know if you know about the grading on a curve. You know, like when you go to university, maybe you don't know that, so I'm going to explain it in a different way. We have somebody from our church who's in nursing school. And, and Amberly, she's, she's in nursing school, and she wants to get into the next level of nursing school. And she was worried because she's only got like a, like, really low, like 90% average or something. And uh, uh, compared to my, I think it was 94 compared to my 49. Um, and so she's got like a 94% average and she was worried. I'm like, how could you be worried? There's no way, you know 94% of the material. She says, oh, that's not the way it works in university. They grade 
based on comparative. So if there's only six slots and there are six people who've got 95, I don't get in. I'm like, that is nuts. You've got a 94% average and you might not make it in. I'm like, if that was, if, and sometimes we like to think that's how God grades us. He's like, well, you're like a 94% good. As long as you're better than, than, than the, the majority, you're going to make it. I'm going to give you an extra special gift. And so what we do in life is we're looking around. Okay, i got to prove that I'm better than you so that I get extra gifts from God. And that's not how God works. But we do it anyways. <clears throat> we love to judge. We love to tear people down so that we look better. Judging can, all, can also often include the assumptions that you know the motives behind a person's actions. Somebody makes a mistake and we judge them by putting a label on them. And basically, isn't that what judging is? It's labeling things. Judging is labeling or, or evaluating somebody else. So somebody comes and somebody says, look, I'm dealing with a drug addiction. And we say, oh, you're just a, you're just a, a druggie and you're just a punk. Or you're just, and, and we don't say, well, what if that person is dealing with some messed up stuff in their life? But no, we evaluate them based on their action, and we don't have the authority to do that. We can point out that the action isn't good, but we don't have the authority to assume the heart of man. And that's what we do when we judge. We assume the heart of man. If you go and you volunteer, for example, Love Lives Here, you might, you might meet a prostitute. And, and your first reaction might be, your first reaction might be, how can this person have that kind of horrible morals that they would sell themselves for money. And you evaluate them, you, you, you put them on your scale of morality, and is what they're doing wrong? Yes. But you don't have the authority to judge the condition of their spirit. You don't have that authority. So you can correct the behavior, but the moment you make an assumption about their spirit, about their emotions, and about their heart, you're risking being a judge. And you don't know what they've gone through. And so you don't even know if you could ever handle the pain that they have been through. I worked, I worked for a couple of years as the director of a Bible camp, Fisher Bay Bible Camp on the reserves. And I want to tell you something. I honestly believe that probably, I would guess three out of four, and Heather's nodding here, I bet you three out of the four girls on the, that came to our summer camp had been sexually abused. Because at least 50% of them told us that. And if 50% are telling you, the odds have to be that at least three quarters of those girls had been sexually abused. And you look at that. You look at that hopelessness that, is only, that, that in their minds can only be covered by drugs and alcohol. Which gets them into a place where they owe somebody something. And now to pay for that something, as 16, 17, 18-year-old girls who run away from their abusers, get as far away from the aunts or from the uncles and the cousins and the grandparents who have abused them. Everywhere they look, they see people who have sexually abused them. Some of them have been abused three, four, five times by different people in their lives. And so they run away from the reserve and they go to the only place they can afford, downtown Winnipeg. And what do they end up getting into? The only thing they know, the only thing that pays their bill, the only thing that helps them feed their child or their addiction. And their addiction is there to drown out the pain that they're feeling. And what happens when I meet them? All I see is a prostitute. I don't see a broken little girl who's been abused by an aunt, by, I keep saying aunt, by an uncle by a grandfather, by a friend of the family. I don't see that. And the moment I judge them based on this, the moment I, I, I write them off, I fail to see in them what God sees in them. I have seen some people do some horrible things. I have people close to me who have done some horrible things. I have people who I've said this other weeks that I want to punch them in the face. Let's be real. There are people that I sometimes want to punch in the face. And before I punch them in the face, the first thing I have to do is say, Jesus, what made them such horrible people? <laughs> I know it's a weird question, but I have to ask myself, Jesus, what made them such a horrible person? And more often than not, God gives me a clue into what broke them. 
And the moment I see what broke them, the desire to punch them in the face changes. I'm still hurt by their actions. I'm still damaged by their actions. I still feel pain because of their actions. But I no longer judge them as much as I pity them and I want to pray for them and I, I desperately want the Holy Spirit to get a hold of their life. You see, stop putting labels on people and, and try and consider what their heart must be like, what they are going through to make them so angry, so bitter, so hurtful. So judging is doing all those things. But here's what judging is not doing. And i got to be very clear about this, like extremely clear about this. Judging is not the same as correcting or pointing out a flaw to another Christian. When somebody points out your flaws as a Christian, one, one believer to another, you do not have the right to read this verse to them. That, you, you don't have the authority to do that. Because that's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is not saying you don't get to correct people. Because that would be contrary to the rest of the Bible. As a matter of fact, in the Bible we are told to correct one another. We are told that sin is sin and within the body of Christ, and I'm going to be clear about that, within the body of Christ, it should not be tolerated. That we are not to allow our brothers and sisters to fall away from God because of the bad things, or the, I don't even want to say bad things, because of the mistakes that they are making. If the jokes that they are telling are leading them farther from Christ, we need to correct that. If the language they use, if the way they're treating people, the Bible says we need to correct that. As a matter of fact, as we look deeper into this verse, we realize that this verse is talking far more about the world around us than the people within us. It is talking about the broken people outside that we need to be very careful about because if you read later on, we talk about don't throw your pearls to the swine. And then the next verse later on says, talks about salvation. Jesus is leading us to a point to know how to reach the lost. And he's not trying to call unbelievers swine. It's, culturally, it's a cultural thing that they would understand. Pigs were considered unclean. They were considered unclean or unholy. And so he's saying, be careful how you present yourself to the unholy. Because if you come and you try and shove your shove your religion down their throat with judgment, they're going to tear you to pieces. You see, it's not about inside the church. It's talking about how do you treat the world around you. Luke 17, 3 says, If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. That's a pretty strong word. Just the word itself sounds pretty strong. And if they repent, forgive them. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. 1 Corinthians 5, 11. Galatians 6 verse 1 and more all speak about the importance of correcting people with inside this, this, this body of believers. In Proverbs it says, iron sharpens iron. I want to tell you something. That is not a, a gentle process. Think about how hard iron is. And then you're, you, you're, you're, you're sharpening with an iron axe. You're, you're with an iron axe and that thing gets chipped. It's got rough edges. What does another iron axe do? It it smashes off the rough edges. Iron sharpening iron isn't always a gentle process. But inside the body of believers, we are called to help one another. We have to remember that judging and correcting are different. Judging is issuing a sentence, a condemnation, putting a title on somebody else. You are bad. You are evil. Oh, just a prostitute. Just a, maybe somebody dresses wrong, and I won't say it because there's kids, but sometimes we have words that we use for people who don't dress modestly. And we say, that's, that girl, she's just a whatever. You don't, that's judging. That's judgmental attitude. But correcting is different. Correcting is getting to know that person, learning to love that person, and in love, helping them along. Everybody in this church probably knows that every now and again, I have a problem with, you know, not with weight. I'm, 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 I've lost some weight, but somehow my feet have taken all that weight. And what ends up happening is every now and again, I'm not strong enough in my car, and, and the heavy feet, they just, they weigh me down, and my legs get tired, and I can't hold my feet up. And, 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 and every now and again, um, somebody will come along, I'd get my attention with some shiny lights, 
and, and they'll pull me over and say, hey, buddy, um, maybe you need to work out more because your foot seems a bit heavy and it's weighing down your gas pedal. Um, and so the police, they're there to keep me accountable, okay? But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I actually am not found guilty until I go before the judge. And when I go before the judge, he can say, you're a menace, he hasn't yet, don't worry. But he could, I could go before a judge and he could say, you're a menace to society. I'm taking your driver's license. He can do that. Now, the police officer doesn't do that to me. That's what the, that's what the judge does. Or maybe, I know, I, I have somebody in my life, somebody accused them of something that was completely false. And the police came and said, you know what? Somebody has said your behavior is illegal. Here's a summons to go to court. Do you know what? That police officer doesn't get to decide if, if my friend has a criminal record. That's not their, that's not, they don't have the right. They can correct behavior. They can stop the fight. If they go to a bar and two people are duking it out, the police, they stop the fight. They may put you in jail for the night, but they don't actually have the authority to judge you. And as Christians, we keep each other accountable. Not that we police each other, but we keep each other accountable, but we need to recognize there's a difference. We do not get to condemn one another. We correct behavior. But here's something very interesting for you. It's a verse that we love. We love the verse that says, get the, get the two by four out of your own eye. Here's a verse that we don't love. This is Paul writing. He wrote, he wrote, to, the, he wrote to the Corinthians and he told them, don't hang out with sexually immoral people in a letter. And they misunderstood what he was saying, and so he rewrote to clarify. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13. I wrote to you in my letter to not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral. He's like, so when I told you not to hang out with bad people, I didn't mean bad people outside, outside of the faith. Those people you could still hang out with. Not at all meaning the people of the world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or slander, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is of mine to judge those outside the church? What business is it of mine to judge those who are not part of the family of believers. But it says, no, aren't you actually supposed to correct the people? Aren't you actually supposed to judge the people inside the church? Correct the behavior inside the church. Expel the wicked person from among you. Now, we're not talking about expelling people from amongst our church this morning, but what we are doing is we're saying, look, when Jesus is talking, isn't it funny that Jesus does the same thing? If you look at the entire life of Jesus, who does Jesus love to hang out with? I know you don't have to raise your hand or shout it out, but I'll tell you, who does Jesus love to hang out with? He's criticized all the time. Because who's he hanging out with? The idolaters. He's hanging out with the greedy. He's hanging out with the prostitutes. He's hanging out down there, and these guys are getting, not he's not getting drunk, but these guys are getting drunk. These guys are partying. These guys are having a good time. And the religious people, they start coming up to him like, Jesus, how dare you hang out with those sinners, those evil people, those people condemned to hell. And Jesus' response is always, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not the judge. I came. I came, out, I came to this earth to hang out with those people. I came to make a difference. I came to change the world. And then he turns the tables. And who does he criticize? He's not out there criticizing all these people who aren't part of the family. He looks at the Pharisees and, who are supposed to be part of the family. He says, actually, guys, buckle up, you know. Remember we talked about a couple weeks ago, buckle up, I just made myself a whip. And you know who I'm going to whip? I'm not over there, I'm not over there at the bar and at the prostitutes, I'm not whipping them. Change your behavior. And it's just interesting what that looks like. You see, again, this verse is talking more about the world and about our self-evaluation than it's talking about Judging people within the body of believers. And do not get me wrong. I am not saying now that as we leave this church, you all get to look at each other and be like, okay, so now, pastor said, buckle up. I get to nail you to the cross. You know, that's not what I'm saying, and we'll get to that. What I'm, I'm just reminding us that we need to be careful not to use that as verse as an excuse to not be corrected. So what is Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 6 really talking about? 
Number one, I believe that it is telling us it is about striving to be closer to God. You see, we like to look at it and say, it says, do not judge me. You don't get to judge me. But what it's really saying is, no, judge yourself. That's what it says. It says, stop judging other people. That's what it says. It says, stop judging other people all the time and start with judging yourself. Because you've probably got a two-by-four sticking out of your head. And it's actually saying, hey, if you want to make a difference, if you want to make a difference, don't go try and, try and do all this incredible stuff and judge other people into, the, into heaven when they look at you and they see a hypocrite. Because when you do that, it's like throwing this incredible gift of salvation to the swine and they just tear it to pieces. Because they look at you and they say, if that's what it's all about, I am never going to step foot through the church ever. I'm never coming through those doors ever again. I do quite a few funerals actually, not a few, but I've done four I think since I've been home. And at every funeral I get the same thing from a whole bunch of people. The only time I'm ever going to step through the church is at a funeral or when I'm being carried in in a box after I'm, I'm dead. And I, and I always say, well, what, why is that? Because I know the people who come to your church. Not our church, but like the church. I know too many people. They're always criticizing me, and I'm not even a believer yet. And I go into the church, and they don't criticize each other. Most of them never recognize their own flaws. Maybe it's time for me, not to look at your flaws, maybe it's time for me to go, Rick, do I have something to work on? And you know, the first thing I, I, I think about, yeah, but, but I'm, not quite, I'm not quite as bad as that guy or that guy. No, 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 no. The Bible's saying, stop doing that. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 6 says, it's time to start looking at your own life. Stop comparing yourself to other believers, recognizing that God is going to evaluate you based on what he has called you to do. God is going to, you're going to get the rewards based on what God has asked you to do. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes, sometimes in my life, I feel like I'm getting less rewards than somebody who's actually worse than I am. And I've seen that in my life. That there are some Christians who seem to be less full of the Holy Spirit than that brand new believer. That brand new believer still struggles with swearing all the time. I was just talking to a guy the other day. He said he was at a Bible study. The guy walks up to him and he says, he says, Pastor, I don't know what the F, and he said all the words, I don't know what the F this verse is saying. This guy was full of joy. Like, he was full of the Holy Spirit, man. He's like, I don't know what the F this verse is saying. And, and, he, and you say, well, how did Rick, there's no way that guy could be full of the Holy Spirit. You know what? He was experiencing the love and the joy and the peace that Christ has to give because he was obedient to come to Jesus. Do you know what? For the next three weeks, I think it was, for the next three weeks, every time they got together for a Bible study, this guy would always do that, you know? Okay, so I, I did what you told me to do. I read this, and I still, don't, I still don't understand what the F this is all about. By the third week, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of this guy because he was obedient with the first thing, and then the Holy Spirit gave him another job. You see, we don't all have to be a missionary the first day we get saved. It's a process of being obedient to the Holy Spirit. And so three weeks in, he's starting to learn about who God is, and he looks at, he looks at the guy and he says, he says, uh, I don't understand what the F. Um, I'm wondering, maybe I should stop using that language at Bible study. And, uh, and the guy, a guy looks at him and he says, he says, well, is there any reason ever to use that kind of language? And the guy's like, no. And, but, but I want to tell you something. I can almost imagine being there and seeing somebody who's more full of the Holy Spirit than I am half the time. He's got more sins than I do, but he's still more obedient because we all have to be obedient to the next step in our journey. And some of us have a, are at a different stage, and the moment we stop self-evaluating, the moment we stop being obedient to where we are at in life, is the moment we get stagnant in our faith. There was another time, just as an example, I'm using swearing as an example. I was speaking, I was at, I was at Bible camp. I was, uh, I don't know if it was when I was a director or just working, no, I was, at, I was 16 years old. I was working at Circle Square Ranch, and this, it was hilarious, one of the greatest things I ever, can ever remember. This guy, he, he was from the city. Uh, he, was like, he, he was also about the same age as I was, 16. I was an assistant at camp, and he was a counselor. And, and so I was hearing him talking to his buddies. And he was from the city. He'd been dealing drugs. He was a rough, he was a rough, rough, rough character. And he is there. And when he first came to camp, he literally had a posse. He had these guys that they would go into the cabins, and they'd pick fights with people. Um, and he, 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 he was just a 
bit of a jerk, actually. He was not a very nice guy. Um, but on Tuesday, he gives his life to the Lord. And I want to tell you something. This gangbanger from the city, boy, could he evangelize. He was, he'd come and he'd say, you got no idea. God is so effing good to me. You know, I am so full of, you know, like, like my life is so effing changed. And I'm like, shh. And, and I, no joke, people are getting saved. People are getting saved. And, and, and I'm not condoning bad language. The Bible speaks against bad language. But I, well, you have two choices right there. You can judge that person or you can gently correct them. You can gently correct them because we correct people at the stage of life that they're at. And I know for some of you, you might have a hard time understanding that, but I believe that it is important for each of us to evaluate ourselves and get better in our own lives. And it's, it's, our, it's our job as believers to gently encourage our friends. You know, if that guy had been saved a year and he's still F-bombing all the time. Goodness sake, somebody's got somebody's to talk to that boy. But you know what? He's got, more, he's got bigger issues on his first day of Christianity. He's got bigger issues than that right now. And so you can judge him or you can love him and lead him to Jesus. In my own life, I've got to strive to be better. I got distracted there, guys. I've got to strive to be better. Proverbs 12, verse 1, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Now, I know you guys maybe don't like that. You don't like your kids hearing somebody being called stupid in church, but I'm just reading it from my, my Bible here. Proverbs 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. The passage we talked about today is start looking inside. Maybe there's something you need to fix if you're going to be a light into the world. Number two. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. What's it talking about? It's actually talking about evangelism. It's actually talking about the world. That's why it ends with that it ends with that passage that says, do not throw your pearls to swine. Pearls, just for those who don't understand, maybe you haven't read the whole New Testament, there's a couple times in the New Testament where Jesus talks about pearls. He talks about one time that a guy finds his pearl. It's his beautiful pearl. It's a pearl of great price. Um, kind of like jewelry, right? It was just, and that they would sell everything they had to get that. And it's talking about selling everything you have to get that gift that's from God, that salvation, that fruit of the Spirit. You know, that's what it's talking about. It's getting the, the gift that God has. And sometimes the way we throw the gift of God at people, we throw it in such a horrible way that instead of them accepting it, they want to destroy it. So this verse is actually, he's leading you to something. Be careful how you share your faith, because when we do it wrong, we can do more damage than we do good. And so it's, it's actually a verse that's talking far more about salvation. It says, hey... Before you run out into the world and bash people over the head with your Bible and condemn them as they're, as they're doing their things, check yourself. Check yourself. Be the best that you can be. Do that self-correction. And I read that do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. It is, it's about not pushing your faith on those who are clearly not ready. Now, don't get me wrong. Our faith should be evident everywhere we go, in action and in word. It is not okay to just have your faith that has action and no word. It is not okay to have word and no action. But also it is, it is important for you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Because I can walk up, to, I can talk to five people. Every one of them I can share my love of Christ with. But I know that only this one guy is ready to accept the gospel today. And that's the guy I push because I'm sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And I think it's important for us to do that. But first, we need to get ourselves right with God. You need to have something that other people want. Okay? And, and really, that's part of what this verse is saying. Evaluate yourself. Get yourself to the point where when you go talk to somebody, they're not looking at all the things that you're doing that are hypocritical. They're looking at you going, I want that. I want that. That you've got something to offer. I want to tell you something. That 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 gangbanger at camp who walked up to his buddies and he's like, dude, dude, you gotta to come to Jesus. He is so effing good. He is the best bleepity thing. He is sorry, he's 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 so bleepity 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 good. Do you know what? He actually had something to offer. His friends were coming to Jesus because they already saw a change in his life. And as he got closer to God, his language would get much better. I know. His language would get much better. His character got better. We were able to correct him. By the end of the week, we were able to say, okay, buddy, you need to stop using that language. 
But he had something to offer. Do you have something to offer? Because it's easy for us to criticize that guy. But the people around him saw that his life had been changed. When your life changes, you can make a difference in incredible ways. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. We already talked about this the other day. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Evangelism starts with being a person who's ready to change the world, who has something that other people want. If you've got nothing that anybody wants, maybe you've got a two-by-four or a log cabin in your eye. I know there are so many times in my life where I have to do a self-evaluation. Based on the look my wife gave me, I might have to do a self-evaluation of this sermon. But that's okay, I'll do that. And I'll come back better next week. But we have to do that. We have to get better so that we can change the world. And I believe that this, this passage in Matthew chapter 7 is also talking about being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We're not there yet, but I believe that last little point that says, be careful, be careful that you don't throw your pearls to swine. I believe a part of that is saying, you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You need to, you need to always be sharing your faith. You need, to, you need to do self-evaluation. You need to get close to God. But then you need to ask yourself, how am I going to do this? Because next week we're going to talk about how to share our faith. And about how the way that guy did it wasn't perfect. So I won't, I won't do that next week. But the way how that guy did it wasn't perfect. But there's some great ways to share our faith. But we got to know what that looks like. we got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. we gotta be, we got to recognize when it's time to correct somebody. And when it's time to let something go. Because the Holy Spirit's doing something different in their life. I want to tell you something. If we are not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we will chase everybody out of the church. If we are not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we will chase everybody out of the church because guess what? Sometimes, if you're correcting the thing the wrong way and you, that person gets so offended, and it needs to be corrected. But you're not realizing, remember, because you're assuming their heart, you don't realize they've got much bigger issues. And when we, are, when we don't do things the right way, we live in a church, we live in a society where people are afraid to share their struggles. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you again, I got, I'm off track here, but I'm going to remind you again about the Conquer series. I talk about this a couple times because it's important. We live in a, in a society where, where, where condemnation comes so quickly that when people want to be set free, they're terribly afraid to share their baggage. They're terribly afraid to come to somebody with their hands in, with their, with their, spirit, in their spiritual chains and say, here's the chains that I am in, because they're worried that when they do that, they're not going to get love and forgiveness. They're going to get, they're going to be called worse than they really are. Uh, how often does somebody come, they admit their flaw because they want freedom, and then they get judged based on the flaw they're trying to get, get free of. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when we talk to people. How do we address them? How do we address somebody who comes up to you and says, I'm dealing with A, B, or C? Are you sensitive? Because when you are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you're going to see some incredible things happen. Last night, when I got that phone call at 1.30 in the morning, my ears burned. My ears were burning because the person who was talking to me, they were using bad words. They were using the wrong language and it hurt my, it hurt my ears. I'm like, oh, you can't say that. You can't say that. You can't say that. And he was just going off on a tirade about all the bad things in his life and all the bad language he was using. I was like, ooh. But I had to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I had, I had a couple options there. I could have said, you know what? I'm done. Click. Or I could have just let the guy rant and rave and said, you know what? The Bible has something for you. God has something for you. I want to give you one more example. And I've shared this before many times, but it's such an, it was so life-changing in my life that, I, that you're going to hear it a hundred times. Um, if you keep me around that long. And so there, there was a kid in youth, and I talked about this before, who I was at a youth event, and he was, he was one of those troublemakers in youth, and, and I was causing problems. And we got into the vehicle one day, and it was after a hockey game, and I sat down. He was being a little bit goofy, but young people can be goofy. But he put his hand on my leg in a way that made me uncomfortable. And he started rubbing back and forth on my leg, and I'm like, whoa, dude, what is going on here? And so, and so I gently grabbed his hand, didn't yell, didn't scream, just gently grabbed his hand, and said, can you keep your hand to yourself? And I just nicely put it over there, and he just turned around and started decking me in the face. Just started wailing on me, just punching me in the face. I'm like, whoa, dude, what's going on? I grabbed the kid, I grabbed the kid, and I'm like, and I, and I just pin him down. I'm just like, 
I don't know where I got the strength. I'm not a very strong guy, and he was bigger than me. But I just pinned him down, just held him there. He's, I don't even know what happened. He was just inappropriately touching me, and then he started punching me in the face. And, and so I'm holding this guy here, and, 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 and he calms down. He calms down, and he's just now he's just glaring at me. And I'm like, I don't even know what I did wrong. And we take the kids to, to, to McDonald's or whatever, and, and, and everything in me is making judgment about this kid's character. I'm judging him big time. Like, first of all, that inappropriate touching made me super uncomfortable, dude. I'm judging. And then, and then the next thing that goes on, he punches me in the face. Oh, what a, what a punk kid. I'm judging. And you know what? And I've told you guys this before, but I went home, and everything in me just wanted to rail on him. I want, he was 16 years old already. Like, I wanted to call his parents and be like, he's not allowed to come to youth ever again. He punched me in the face. He touched me inappropriately. I am done. And I went home, and I said, the Holy Spirit just said, calm down. And so I didn't do anything. Now, that behavior had to be corrected. And I corrected that behavior, but you know what I did? I waited. And I prayed desperately to God that night. I said, God, what happened? And first thing I prayed, I said, did I make, did I make a mistake? And you're like, Rick, it's not your fault. It's never your fault when somebody punches you in the face. But, well, could I have avoided that? And I said, God, show me the heart of this boy. And, and, and you guys remember this story, parts of it. I haven't shared it in as much detail before. But, but two days later, God told me, go to his house and be there when he gets off the bus after school. So I went over to this kid's house. It was about 10 minutes away. And, and he gets off the bus and he sees his youth pastor waiting there. I said, hey, can we go for a drive? And he gets in my vehicle and, and I look and, 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 he, and I said, actually, you know what? We're not going to even go for a drive. We're going to stay here where you by your parents' place. That way I knew I was accountable. They could see what was going on if they were home. And I looked at this kid and I said, I think you're thinking about suicide. Like, where does that come from? That comes from sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and not judging. And don't get me wrong, I'm not boasting myself up. I judge most of you all the time. No, I'm just, I don't, I don't, I, I don't judge you that much. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is in that moment, God said, today, I want you to get rid of your judgment. And I looked at this kid, and for no reason whatsoever, but God put something on my heart. I said, I think you're thinking about suicide. And I have never seen a 16-year-old cry so deeply. He broke down and wept and wept and wept for probably 25 minutes without saying a word. And at that point, I've lost my judgment now. Like, I'm not judging him at all. I actually, I actually put, my, put my arm around him. Just three days ago, he's touching me on my leg, and I, like he's punching me in the face. And I got my arm, I was like, buddy, it's going to be okay. And this guy, they have a, they have a hayloft for their, for their cows, those big square bales up there. And he'd made, a, he'd made his own gallows. He'd put it up on the rafters, he'd put his noose, and he had his noose up there. And he'd go up there and balance on the bales. He'd balance on the bales in the evening after he'd get home from school. So that day, if I hadn't been there, he would have gone up to his hayloft and balanced on the bales. Rocked them back and forth. How far can he rock that veil without losing control? And the reason I'm telling you this story is because it fits very well with what we're talking about today. I have to ask myself all the time. That story, that story reminds me all the time. What would have happened if in that day I had said, You stupid punk. You are done. You are done in my youth program. You are done. I'm, I'm like, you are, you're not welcome. You are not worthy to come to youth. I got to imagine that on that day, getting home on that bus with nobody waiting outside his door, I can imagine that that, that bail might have very likely gone over. And how many of us, how many of us lose sight of the Holy Spirit because of our hate, because of our anger, because of our bitterness, because of our resentment? <clears throat> We have to recognize that God sees the heart of everybody. And we need to start looking at the heart of the people around us. And so if you've got judgment in your life, if, if, you, if, you, if you've got hatred in your life, if you've got unforgiveness in your life, if you've been somebody who's judging people all the time, I want to challenge you to start asking God to see people through those eyes. I'm going to pick on my wife again because she can handle it. I know I get criticized for this all the time, but I'm going to do it. I think she can handle this one. We, we, went, we went to Vancouver one time. Is that okay to share this story? Okay, we went to Vancouver one time with the youth group. Some of you might have been there. Some of you, some people might have actually been on that mission trip. And we were told we had to give roses to prostitutes. And it was incredible. <clears throat> Giving roses. And Heather goes up, to, well, first we go up to this one girl. Go give her a flower. And, 
actually, I think, were you crying when you gave her the flower? And Heather was crying, and she's giving this girl this flower, and she's like, God just loves you so much, and I want to show you, because flowers are a sign of love. And you know, the lady puts her hand around Heather, and she's like, like, don't worry, sweetie, I'm going to be okay. And here's this lady comforting my wife, who's giving her a rose, to tell her that, and you know this lady's probably been abused, she's probably got a dick, she's like, it's okay, sweetie, you know, like, I'm, I'm all good, I'm going to make it through today. Thank you so much. I know we thank you. And, and so, so here's Heather, and, she, and, she, and, and God is using this prostitute to minister to Heather. And so now that now Heather's been ministered to by this prostitute, now Heather's like, that's right. What an incredible girl this young girl is. She's incredible. How dare anybody ever do anything to this girl? So Heather's walking angrily, and, and every two minutes, we actually had to leave that lady because every two minutes this car would come around the corner, and you could see this guy glaring at us, eh? Like, hey, she's supposed to be making me money. And it was so funny, Heather's looking at Heather's, Heather's like my, my wife gets mad. Never at me, of course. Uh, <clears throat> but she gets mad. And I, you can see she's mad. And she's thinking like, God, I wish I could just like take that guy by the throat and beat the pulp and like just beat him to a pulp. And she's fuming mad. And she's walking. And he drives by. And she trips. And, and in that moment, it was so funny because she told us later, she says in that moment, she recognized that, 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 that she, actually, she actually believes to this day that, that God tripped her. She, she, really? Right? God tripped her in that moment. Flat sidewalk, nothing to trip on. And God was like, how dare you? What he's doing is horribly wrong. But what could have broken a man so much to call people property? And God's heart breaks for that man too. It is not my job to judge as much as I want to rip people to pieces. It's my job to change. Change their heart. To love people. To lead people to Jesus. To be a light to this dark and disgusting world. And so I want to challenge you this morning. If you're living in judgment today, give it to God. Give it to God this morning. I also believe there's people here this morning who have sins in their lives. That you have, that are holding you captive, that you have done something in your life. Somebody here, some of you here have done stuff in your life that you have never been willing to bring to God because you're afraid that if you bring it to the front, you bring it in prayer, and you actually tell somebody about the garbage that you've done in your life, that you're going to be judged and condemned. I want to tell you something, that's not what happens here. There is nothing that you have done in life that God will not forgive. Because that's not who God is. God forgives everyone. He is on the cross. He has been tortured. He has, <coughs> he has had nails put in his arms. He has been beaten, crown of thorns, smashed upon his head. And what does he say? Father, forgive them. Because they just don't get it. So we're going to close in prayer. I'm going to invite the band to come forward. But if you need to be set free from judgment this morning... Bring it to God. If you feel like you're judged everywhere you go, bring it to God. If you feel like you're not good enough, recognize that God doesn't judge you. Bring it to God. And if, none, if nothing that I have said this morning means anything to you, or maybe you even disagree with me, that's okay. Then I have a, I have a job for you this morning. This morning I want you to pray that God is going to show you one person that you can pray for this week so as we talk about leading our friends to Jesus, that you can lead them to Jesus. Because I want to challenge you. Sometimes, sometimes people come up to me after the service and say, Rick, I disagree with you. Or, hey, I'm done coming to a church. I don't like your church because I don't like the way you preach. I'm okay with that. Sometimes I don't like the way I preach either. Sometimes I don't like the way I preach either. But you know what? Coming to church isn't about listening to the pastor. Coming to the church is about growing closer to God with each other. So I want you guys to find somebody to pray with this morning and say, hey, how can we make a difference in our world, whether or not we have a good preacher or not? How can we change our world? Because starting next week, we're going to start talking about how to lead people to Christ. Because we've done, we're talking about vision. Our, our, our leadership team has been talking about vision for the last couple months. We're trying to do it before November. And we've been talking about leading people to Christ and what that looks like, whether it's Alpha or whether it's no Alpha, whether that means you're going to start doing it in your homes. And so starting this week, i got a challenge for you. Everybody should come to church next week knowing who they want to lead to Jesus Christ. And that's when it's going to be a job. And we're going to start this week by not judging them. Picking somebody who you've been judging for years and throwing the judgment away and saying, I want to lead them to Christ. So whether you need healing this morning, whether you need to forgive somebody, whether you need forgiveness, I want to challenge you to bring that to Jesus because God does not judge you. He leads you into, into His grace. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your grace. God, I know that so often I am a horrible preacher. 
but you still do something every week. God, I know that I make mistakes, and I'm so thankful that you don't judge me, but you correct me. You change me. You help me become better, God. So if I've done something this week, show me how I can grow. If there's somebody here this week who's gotten out of line, help, help them to know where they can grow so that when they go next week to share their faith, they're not seen as somebody with a log cabin sticking out of their face. God, but there's somebody who everybody looks to and everybody loves. God, we love you so much. And we just pray that you do something incredible today, incredible this week. In your holy name, amen. I want to read a verse for you to meditate on as we sing. But in your hearts, revere God, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, the reason for the hope you have. So my challenge is, do you have hope? But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Some of us need to give our behavior to God with no judgment, and God is going to do some incredible things. So let's give it to God and uh, spend some time worshiping Him.